for today's lesson, what we want to think about is the actual three-dimensional structure of molecules, specifically alkanes. And we're going to start off with ethane. And this program right here that I'm using now is just a Chem 3D. So it's the three-dimensional version of ChemDraw. And it allows us to kind of view these different organic molecules in their three-dimensional perspective. Now, this these two carbons in ethane are connected by a single bond. A single bond is free to undergo rotation. And it is helpful to think about these methyl groups as if they're rotating helicopter blades. And at room temperature, these things are constantly spinning. But they don't really have angular momentum. And so they'll spin in one direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, for a fraction of a second and then immediately stop and start spinning the opposite direction. And they might only make like a quarter of a turn and then they'll make eight turns this way and then they'll turn back for three turns. It's all quite random, but they are constantly moving. And so what we're showing right now is just kind of a snapshot of the actual dynamic motion that's going on in an ethane molecule. And the snapshot has two energetic extremes. This particular snapshot represents the lowest energy state. In order to kind of understand why this particular three-dimensional arrangement represents the lowest energy state, let's first draw, let's compare it with the highest energy state. So what I want to do now is reorient this molecule so that it's in a higher energy state. And we can do this, hopefully. Um, I'm going to select this hydrogen and move it over here. And I'll take this hydrogen and slide it over here, and this hydrogen and slide it over here. And what I did was approximate the rotation of that methyl group. Like I said, it's constantly rotating. And I rotated it so that in a three-dimensional overlay like this, the hydrogens on the adjacent carbons are now what's called eclipsed. And to understand why this represents the highest energy state, we can, let's see, model display. I'm going to go ahead and show a space filling model. The ball and stick diagram that I just showed you doesn't take into account the full kind of range of where the electrons are going. So this hydrogen atom right here has a nucleus and that's what the ball and stick model focuses on but this particular space filling model shows you what the actual electron cloud resembles. And what you'll notice is when we try to look down the barrel of that carbon-carbon bond these hydrogens, this, this hydrogen, uh, they randomly label the hydrogens with a number. Um, this hydrogen, let's see if I can click it, right here, is eclipsed. In other words, it's directly over top of this hydrogen in the back. So it's hydrogen four by the labeling here, and or I have no idea what they're doing with the numbers there. In any event, this hydrogen on the right-hand side and the, high, and the yellow hydrogen on the left-hand side are what's referred to as eclipsed. And the space filling model kind of illustrates why eclipsing is a problem. And we'll focus on these two hydrogens right here because they're, they're more eclipsed. And the edges of the electron density, so this yellow uh, sphere right here represents the cloud of electron density for that hydrogen. Notice how it is very close. In effect, it's bumping into the cloud of electron density for this yellow sphere back here. The electrons are repelling each other by negative charge attraction, so this represents a high energy state. And if you wanted the molecule to stay like this, you would have to hold it, kind of pinch it with your fingers, and twist it, and then it would you would have to hold it in this position. What Chem3D does is it allows you to run an energy minimizing uh, calculation. And uh, MM2 stands for something. But if I click on this button right here, the molecule will actually recalculate, and these are the calculations right here, showing you that this now is a lower energy state. So notice how in this lower energy state, the hydrogens are no longer eclipsed. They're no longer sitting right on top of each other, but instead they're staggered. So the staggered represents the lowest energy state, and that previous model where the hydrogens were directly over top of each other is referred to as eclipsed and the highest energy state. And we can kind of appreciate how this is a lower energy state because the sphere of electron density for this hydrogen is no longer bumping directly into the sphere of electron density for this hydrogen back here. 
the space that we've created allows those negatively charged electrons to exist further away from each other. That minimizes the electron-electron repulsion and represents a more stable state. Go back to the ball and stick model right here. So while I said before that you can think about these methyl groups as spinning around like helicopter blades, spinning around randomly, it's much like a game of Uno where there are skip cards and reverse cards. And so these, this methyl group right here is rotating constantly like a play around a, a circuit, like a play around a card table, but it's not evenly timed. It's not like it rotates at the same rate constantly. What it does is it tends to stall out. It just kind of stops for a while in these low energy states. And then when you go to a higher energy state, so we'll take this one and we'll try to push it back to that eclipsed conformation. Whoops, I gotta use the other. I'm sure there's a faster way of doing this. So I'm gonna move it back to that higher energy eclipsed conformation right here. And it will spin through this but it passes very quickly through the eclipsed conformation and goes right back to some type of staggered conformation. And so this is the staggered and what I just had here was the eclipsed. In two dimensions, which is the surface that we have to work with on paper and most of the time on a whiteboard in a normal classroom and on a computer screen, a two dimensional surface is kind of what you have to use. And so in order to show a staggered conformation two dimensionally, we have to use the wedge and dash diagrams. So this right here is a wedge dash diagram for ethane shown in a staggered conformation. And I'll try to put these two screens side by side so you can appreciate what it is that I'm trying to show. So here, um, let's, right here. This is, these two illustrations are trying to show the same thing. I have a carbon right here that refers to this carbon. This carbon over here, C2 in my three, Chem 3D model, represents this carbon. They're in the same plane. They are flat relative to the surface of the screen that you're looking at. This hydrogen is also in that plane, and this hydrogen down there is in the plane. So this hydrogen corresponds to this hydrogen, and this hydrogen corresponds to that hydrogen. This yellow hydrogen right here, the one in front, is this hydrogen shown with a wedge. And then the hydrogen in the back is the hydrogen with the dash. And so this right here is an attempt. So sorry, this is an attempt to show in two dimensions what it is that you're looking in three dimensions. So this is the staggered conformation of ethane using a wedge dash model. If we want to try to show the staggered conformation of the eclipse, sorry, the eclipsed conformation of ethane. So I'm going to change this three dimensional perspective to eclipse it. So I'll just kind of move all these hydrogens around. So now this is the eclipsed conformation, and we'll look at that kind of side on side. And in my ChemDraw 2D model, let's see. I want to try to model this three-dimensional structure using wedge dash diagrams. So I'll have the two carbons are in the plane of the screen of my paper, or the screen of your of your computer screen. There's a hydrogen that's in the same plane. That's this hydrogen up here. And then another hydrogen in the plane. It's this hydrogen over here. I'm going to put labels on those. That's a hydrogen. That's a hydrogen. And then this yellow hydrogen I need to represent with a wedge. It's coming towards me. So there's my hydrogen. And then this white hydrogen here in the back I'll show with the dash. And then I'll also show the wedge and the dash model for the other hydrogen. So this right here represents a wedge dash diagram of an eclipsed ethane. The eclipsed ethane is the highest energy state, and the staggered ethane is the lowest energy state. This wedge dash diagram is not the best way to show these, but the question in the lesson asks us to draw a wedge dash diagram of the staggered and eclipsed conformations for ethane. So here they are. This is staggered and this is eclipsed. A better way of showing these is something called a Newman projection. So a Newman projection. tries to look at the molecule from the perspective of sighting down a carbon-carbon bond, like looking down the barrel of a toy gun, evidently, so as not to get censored on YouTube. So you look down the barrel of your toy gun, and what you see is an overlay of those two carbons right here. So I'm trying to sight down the barrel of this carbon-carbon bond. 
and I see uh, three hydrogens off the front carbon and three hydrogens off the back carbon. Because of the particular perspective of this Newman projection, it almost looks like I'm looking at a hexagon. Kind of connect the dot right here, you look at a hexagon. And the internal bond angles right here between this hydrogen in the front and the hydrogen in the back this is actually 60 degrees from the perspective that I'm at. And therefore, from this hydrogen up top to the yellow hydrogen, the flat perspective that I have sh looks like it's a bond angle of 120 degrees. And that's because we're not fully appreciating the fact that they're not in the same plane. There's some three-dimensional character there. These are technically tetrahedral and 109.5 degrees. But when you take a Newman projection, which is this perspective right here, and it's almost like you just kind of push that thing flat with your hand up against the computer screen, it flattens it out so it looks like it's a 120 degree bond angle. And the way that you draw a Newman projection, so I'll, I'll try to put these side by side again. This is a Newman projection of ethane. The carbon in the front right here, I have labeled with the letter C. Now it's bad form to put that letter C in your Newman projection. So instead, this little dot right there that's highlighted in red because uh, Chemdar doesn't know what I'm trying to do, that red box right there represents that yellow carbon. That's my front carbon. And coming off of the front carbon is a hydrogen going straight up. That's what I'm showing right there. A hydrogen cutting down to the left. That's this hydrogen here. And a hydrogen cutting down to the right. That's this hydrogen right here. The carbon in the back is represented by this large circle. And um, so this carbon right here in the back is this large circle. Now, I, I realize that uh, in any art class, depth perception would tell you that the thing in the front is supposed to be big and the thing in the back is supposed to get progressively smaller. We decided not to do that. Actually, Newman decided not to do that. These projections are named after some dude named Newman. Uh, I'm sure he was an important person. And I'm also sure he's dead, so he doesn't care. So this right here, this Newman projection, the carbon in the back is shown as a large circle. And what you'll notice is the carbon in the back has hydrogens that are extending up to the left, up to the right, and straight down. And so that's what that bond is trying to show, a hydrogen going up to the left, up to the right, and straight down. This is a Newman projection of a staggered conformation. The Newman projection for an eclipsed conformation just means that these hydrogens in the front whoa, are sitting directly on top of each other. So I've tried to do this a couple of times, and it's not easy. But I can make an eclipsed conformation by just sliding these hydrogens over so that they're eclipsed. They're sitting on in the when I look down the barrel, they are eclipsed because in this perspective of sliding down the barrel, the hydrogens are sitting directly on top of each other. So if I want to show a Newman projection of something like this, it's problematic because the hydrogen in the back actually rotates to the point where you really can't see anything at all. Um, it doesn't like my bond lengths. So let's Let's fix a number of things right here. OK, so I'm going to shrink this down a little bit so I can move these hydrogens. But if I want to um, make an eclipse confirmation, then this hydrogen actually sits right on top of that one. This hydrogen sits on top of that one. And this hydrogen sits on top of that one. And you're not seeing anything at all. So instead, a more common way of showing an eclipse confirmation is to cheat a little. So instead of sighting directly down the barrel, you kind of just off-center it just a tad, something like this. And so when you're trying to show that, you just kind of move these hydrogens over so that they're not staggered, but they're not totally eclipsed. And so this is a common way of them trying to diagram an eclipse conformation. It's technically wrong because an eclipse conformation, these hydrogens should be sitting directly on top of each other. But any artistic rendering that's two dimension, if you actually show that, then you just lose those hydrogens altogether because that's what eclipsed means. So this is an, a common way of showing an eclipsed conformation for a Newman projection. Um, the closer you can get those without actually overlapping them, the better you should feel about yourself. But it's not letting me do that. OK, so I'm just going to take these two images right here. We'll label these. This is the staggered Newman conformation. And then this over here would be the eclipsed Newman confirmation. And that becomes uh, the, the answer right here. Now, 
it seems like they should have come up with a better way of showing eclipse Newman confirmations. And you're going to find that we use Newman projections all the time. And they're pretty powerful and useful for a lot of things. Can't get that quite small. There we go. Um, it's a good idea. I mean, it's, it's really powerful to show a Newman projection because it allows you to draw out three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface, which is the bane of, of organic chemistry. We're constantly thinking three-dimensionally about what's going on, but we're stuck writing on two-dimensional surfaces. And so you would think that they would come up with a better way of showing something that's eclipsed, but the truth is the molecule spends so little time in the eclipsed conformation that the staggered conformation is the one that we draw most of the time. Most of your diagrams that you're going to show are showing the staggered conformation. Because if a molecule does happen to be eclipsed, it's passing through that eclipsed conformation as it's rotating to a more stable staggered conformation. So that's why we didn't worry too hard, too much about the fact that the way we draw eclipse conformations is goofy. The staggered conformation is by far the much more important conformation, and it will describe a lot of what we're trying to show you. All right, so kind of as a summary of what we've gotten to so far, here's ethane, and here's a staggered confirmation of ethane and an eclipsed confirmation of ethane. Now, this particular diagram is neither a wedge dash diagram nor a Newman projection. It's just a 3D rendering of staggered and eclipsed ethane. If we want to try to show all the different ways of drawing a staggered conformation of ethane, here is that wedge dash structure that we started with today. And here's the more relevant and more useful Newman projection. So a Newman projection attempts to show uh, uh, kind of a, a look down the barrel of carbon-carbon bonds by putting this little point. This is the carbon in front. And then the big circle right here is the carbon in the back. There's an older version that they used, and I don't know exactly why. You'll see it show up from time to time. It's called a sawhorse diagram, and it's basically uh, you take the Newman projection and then you practice good gun safety by pointing the barrel slightly away from your eyeball. And that's kind of what they've done right here. The eclipsed confirmation, we saw the wedge dash diagram for this. Here's a, a better looking Newman projection of an eclipse confirmation where you just kind of tilt your perspective just a little bit so that you can see that it is eclipsed. And then the sawhorse diagram kind of is, is uh, the best of, of both worlds. It does allow you to think about what this looks like three-dimensionally, but it's just not used that often anymore. When describing these different conformations, what they like to talk about is something called a dihedral angle. And I believe this figure is taken out of your textbook. It is probably one of the least useful figures that I found in any textbook. So a dihedral angle is defined as the bond angle between the front hydrogens or the front bonds and the back bonds of a Newman projection. That's the best way to define dihedral angles. And notice how the, the end of that definition specifies that we're thinking about Newman projections. So a dihedral angle is the angle between the front atom and the back atom coming off in a Newman projection. So this is a 60 degree dihedral angle right here between this hydrogen right here and this hydrogen, you would not talk about dihedral angles because the definition of a dihedral angle is the angle between the bond off the front carbon and the bond off the back carbon. And both of these hydrogens are coming off the back carbon. But this hydrogen and this hydrogen down here, that is a dihedral angle that you would talk about. This hydrogen in the front, the hydrogen in the back, and their bond angle is 180 degrees. And this would be another 60 degree bond angle. Um, some textbooks and probably some professors are really picky about positive or negative 100, sorry, positive or negative 60 degrees. I'm not. Uh, you just call this is a 60 degree dihedral angle. This is also a 60 degree dihedral angle. And this is a 180 degree dihedral angle. For your eclipsed confirmations, this front hydrogen and the back hydrogen have a zero degree dihedral angle and the front hydrogen and this back hydrogen over here would have a 120 degree dihedral angle. That's how we think about dihedral angles. Dihedral angles are important because they represent a source of strain. Um, the strain that we're going to talk about here is torsional strain, and I tried to show you these space filling models before. When you have an eclipsed conformation of ethane, it doesn't seem like these two hydrogens are bumping into each other, until you come up with a diagram that really tries to show 
where the electrons on this hydrogen kind of roam out to. So think about this is where you tether your dog, but this is the extent of the dog's leash right here. And that's what this model is trying to show you. And if you have two dogs that are aggressive and you tether them in this position, they're going to get close enough that you'll never, they'll never stop barking at each other. Whereas in a staggered conformation, we twist it slightly, and now those dogs aren't quite so close to each other. Yeah, they probably still bark at each other because that's what dogs do. So that's the idea. When you are staggered, you have minimized the amount of torsional strain. And when you are eclipsed, you have maximized the amount of torsional strain. Torsional strain is kind of like a twisting strain. And if you wanted a molecule of ethane to stay like this, you would actually have to kind of pinch it there and hold it there. Uh, you imagine one hand holding down this methyl group and one hand holding down this methyl group and it would be twisting and you'd have to exert some effort to keep the two methyl groups where they are and if you let go with one of your hands it would kind of fall to this position this is your lowest energy position and this is where the torsional strain is minimized the next question we want to ask is what does the energy look like if we start spinning one of those methyl groups so what i'm showing here is uh, this is kind of a newman projection um, it's like a Newman projection staring down the carbon-carbon bond of ethane. And these hydrogens are given Christmas colors, hopefully to help you understand what we're trying to do. So what you'll notice is we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different diagrams. And in all seven of those diagrams, the hydrogens in the back are left alone. The red hydrogen is, it's red labels just to kind of help you see that we're leaving that hydrogen where it's at. And so if you look at every one of those seven pictures in the back carbon, the red hydrogen just kind of stays up the whole time. And so what we're doing is we're taking this front carbon and we're spinning it. And you can tell that we're spinning it because the red hydrogen kind of moves over. You can think about like clicking, the click, click, it moves over to to this position right here. And hopefully you'll notice that this, I should probably um, expand to this. So let's try this diagram right there. Um, all right, so here we are, the carbon in the front, I'm gonna take that hydrogen and every new diagram is going to involve me moving that front hydrogen by 60 degrees. Now, if you make a full circle, that's 360 degrees. So if I'm moving in increments of 60 degrees, it here is at, it's at zero. And then here, the dihedral angle is now 60 degrees. Here, the dihedral angle between the two red hydrogens is 120 degrees. Notice how it goes up by 60 degrees every time. The dihedral angle is now 180 degrees. The dihedral angle is 240 degrees, and then 300 degrees, and then zero degrees again. So the reason that you see seven different pictures here is because they're just repeating the same spot. A zero and a 360 are exactly the same. Right? If you turn 360 degrees, you're right back where you started from. Energetically speaking, you'll notice that this represents an eclipsed conformation. An eclipsed conformation is a high energy state. On the y-axis, I have my energy. And along the x-axis are those different steps as I'm rotating through the full circle. So click, click, I move 60 degrees, another 60 degrees, 60 degrees, as you're kind of spinning that front carbon. All of the eclipsed conformations are the highest energy states, and they're all the same energetically. All of the staggered conformations, so here we see that the, the red hydrogens are 60 degrees away from each other, but we're in a staggered conformation. This is another staggered conformation, and this is a third staggered conformation. All the energy states here are the same, they are low, and so if we were playing a card game and we were rotating this around the table, it would stall out and it would stay here forever. Like 99% of the time, it would stay in one of these three positions. So 33% of the time it's here, and then it passes extremely quickly through this position, and then 33% of the time it stays here, and then it passes extremely quickly through this position, and 33% of the time it would stay right here. And then it would just be at this position, at these eclipsed positions, for a very small amount of time. So these are the people that, uh, playing a card game, know what they're doing, they take their turn quickly, and then this is the person that you hate playing with because it just stays on their turn forever as you're waiting and waiting for them to make their decision. And so that's kind of what happens when these things rotate around. 
they have some metrics here in this diagram that show you the energetic difference. And this is helpful. Um, I believe room temperature will definitely allow for transitions to occur of greater than 12 kilojoules per mole. And the reason for that is when you're sitting inside of any room, there are air molecules in that room that are careening about. And so at room temperature, there are going to be collisions between molecules of air and your ethane. And those collisions will hit this molecule with enough energy to push it over this energy hill and back down to another energy state. And so that's why it can rotate. That's why it moves back and forth between these different energy states is just random collisions with high energy air molecules. So that's why a lot of times a chemist will kind of think about energetic barriers. And the only way to get this molecule to stay uh, well behaved in one of these staggered conformations and never pass through this eclipsed conformation is to lower the temperature. So there's not enough ambient background energy to kind of knock it uh, out of this valley over the hill and down to the next valley again. Um, we've kind of talked about energy diagrams already. The energy that's required to climb up out of a state and get to the next state, that maximum amount of energy is called the activation energy. And whatever the structure of the molecule is at the tip of the activation energy, we call that the transition state. Transition states are really, uh, I don't want to say impossible, but nothing's impossible. There are very low probability that you will ever in your life encounter instrumentation that can directly measure the transition state. It just passes through the transition state so quickly that even photons moving at the speed of light just cannot capture that transition state reproducibly. So the transition state is important to chemists because this it's this state that we can never truly observe. But if we know what's on either side of the transition state, we can kind of figure out what it must look like. So transition states are a big deal. So for the lesson, you need to draw an energy diagram showing the dihedral angles for ethane as it goes from 0 to 360 degrees. And that's simply this image right here. You're going to take this image. Um, you don't need to label the transition state and the activation energy unless you want more complete notes when you're studying. But your energy diagram should show these increments and these structures and kind of going up and down. Uh, you can record the actual values on the y-axis, but most of the time we just understand that lower values are down here and higher values are up here. So this is the diagram right here that you need to insert into uh, this answer right here. Okay, question D. Explain why the eclipsed rotomer has a higher potential energy than the staggered rotomer. And that is due, so the energy is higher for the eclipsed conformation then for the staggered conformation because of electron-electron repulsion. It's maximized in the eclipsed conformation because these electron clouds kind of bump into each other and it's minimized. It's never zero. There's always going to be some energy, associated, some strain associated with the negatively charged electrons repelling each other, but it's minimized when you're in the staggered conformation. So if we try to put that more carefully into words. The eclipsed conformation has a uh, has more electron electron repulsion than the staggered conformation because the electron clouds of the hydrogens are closer together and this specific type of strain, any time that you have eclipsed strain in a Newman projection is equal to torsional strain. So that's, that's how we use that term. When is there torsional strain? Well, there's torsional strain whenever it's not staggered. So if you have eclipsed strain, that's the same thing as talking about torsional strain. And you might have noticed that we like to come up with multiple terms for exactly the same thing over and over again. And that simply makes it harder for students to be successful in organic chemistry classes, reduces the number of organic chemists, and it's good for job security. So that's why we do that. Moving on to butane. Um, butane has multiple bonds. So I'm going to go back to, let's go back to ChemDraw 2D. Let's see if you get dizzy as I hop from screen to screen to screen. In ChemDraw 2D, uh, butane right here has four carbons. 
And so if you ask for a Newman projection, then you actually have to start to specify which Newman projection are we talking about. A Newman projection will specify which carbon it is that I want to look at in front and which carbon it is that I want to look at in back. So if I'm looking down on butane, it matters which two bonds I'm staring at. And we can probably appreciate that more in ChemDraw 3D. So let's see if I can, whoa. Uh, I'll start over again. And so here's, um, there we are, butane. And I'll kind of, uh, this butane right now is not at its lowest energy. Yes, it is. This butane is at its lowest energy state. And the reason that I can tell that is what you do is you walk down each of the three possible Newman projections. So there's three, there's three Newman projections because I can look down carbon one, carbon two. This is called the C1, C2 Newman projection. I can look down the C2, C3 Newman projection, and I can look down the C3, C4 Newman projection. And the order matters. So this is me looking down the C1, C2 Newman projection. I have carbon one in front, and I have carbon two in back. The C2, C1 Newman projection takes this perspective. Carbon two is in front, and carbon one is in back. And what you'll notice for each of the Newman projections is that all of them are perfectly staggered. So just looking at the bonds that are coming off, all my dihedral angles are 60 degrees. So this is perfectly staggered. This is perfectly staggered. Um, and then that's perfectly staggered as well. So I'm looking down the correct Newman projections. This is the lowest energy state for butane. The highest energy states for butane would involve an eclipsed conformation. So let's see. Okay. Um, so I'm going to look specifically at the C2, C3 conformations of butane. That's what I care the most about. And from this perspective right here, this is a staggered conformation looking down the C2, C3 bonds of butane. And that's what this is trying to show, that name and projection. Let me make sure I line that up correctly with there. So this is carbon number two right here, and this is carbon number three or I guess carbon two and carbon three based on how ChemDraw wants to look at it. So there's carbon two, carbon three, and I can look down the, the, the Newman conformation of this one, down the barrel of that carbon two, carbon three bond, and that's what it's trying to show here in the PowerPoint diagram. So the carbon number two is right here in front, carbon number three is the circle in back, but what you'll notice is there's actually two different staggered conformations. This is also looking down carbon number two in the front and carbon number three in the back, and everything staggered. But energetically speaking, this molecule, this conformation of the molecule, or rotational isomer, it's also called, or rotomer is kind of a slang term for this. This rotomer has a problem. And the problem with this rotomer is that these two methyl groups are spatially kind of running into each other. And it's, you may not be able to see that so much with this diagram. So let's go back to ChemDraw 3D and see if I'm going to rotate this. I'm going to call this right here a methyl group. So I'll see if I can change the atomic label. Nope. All right, some stuff happened while I was away, and I got this figured out now. So on the right-hand side over here, what you'll notice is this is a staggered butane. So uh, we'll zoom in a bit on this one right here. This is a butane that is perfectly staggered across every bond. And I'm going to focus specifically on the C2, C3 Newman projection. On this C2, C3 Newman projection right here, notice how the dihedral angles, that's the angle between the atom in the front and the atom in the back, is about 60 degrees. And over here, it's also about 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees. On this model instead, if we look at this one over here, this is still staggered. And I'm focusing on carbon two, which is right here, and carbon three, which is right there. And I wanna cite down the Newman projection of those. Uh, but this one's getting in the way now. So let's get rid of that other one. Okay. So I want to focus on the C2, C3. And what you'll notice is it's still staggered. Okay, 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees. So all my, all my Newman projection 
um, dihedral angles are 60 degrees, so this is staggered, but these two methyl groups end up being adjacent to each other. This adjacent position has a specific name, and it's called gauche. And I'll show you the spelling of that in a second. It's G-A-U-C-H-E. It's French or not English for something else. I'm so this gauche interaction right here has a problem because these methyl groups now are close enough that they're bumping into each other. This is not torsional strain. Torsional strain is when something is eclipsed. So other types of strain that are not torsional strain, we're going to call steric strain. And structure... And again, that becomes more obvious as soon as you start to look at the space filling model. And so that ballooned up in a hurry. But this right here is the methyl group. And this is the other methyl group that are gauche relative to each other. And you'll see that spatially, those two hydrogens, are, their electron clouds are bumping directly into each other. Um, and so uh, let's, let's unballoon that. Go back to the ball and stick diagram. It was this hydrogen right here and this hydrogen that in the space filling model were smacking into each other. And that electron-electron repulsion is a source of a lot of strain. And so I should be able to run an energy minimization option, which ChemDraw 3D allows me to do. And it's, it works about 90% of the time. Uh, and it should kind of rotate this to get these. Oh, did not do it today. So I'm going to move this. Uh, I'm going to grab this methyl group and move it over here. And I'll grab this hydrogen and put it over there. And then I'll do an energy minimization. Still didn't do it. I don't know what I'm doing, obviously. So we'll try it one more time. And we'll take this hydrogen and put it up over there, and now we'll energy minimize. There we go. Okay, now what you'll notice when you cite down that same C2, C3 Newman projection is everything's still staggered, only now the two methyl groups are on opposite sides of each other. And this is called anti. And this is an anti conformation. Before, what I had were gauche conformations. And if you kind of want to appreciate how uh, much better this is from an energetic perspective, let's go ahead and turn on the space filling model. And those methyl groups that used to be bumping into each other in the last space filling model, that methyl group is right here. And the other methyl group is way over here. So the idea of staggered versus, sorry, staggered conformations have two possible energy states and they're not the same. You can have a staggered conformation where the bulkiest groups are on opposite sides of the atoms, and this is called anti, or you can have staggered conformation where those bulkiest groups are still staggered, but adjacent to each other, and that's called gauche. And so here is the spelling of gauche, as promised, and there's anti. And the methyl groups right here in these staggered conformations in this case, the methyl groups are gauche relative to each other, and in this case, the methyl groups are anti relative to each other. We only use the terms anti and gauche for staggered conformations. So if you're looking at an eclipsed conformation, we don't use the terms uh, anti and gauche to describe eclipsed conformations. We just kind of talk about worst case scenario for eclipsed conformations. Energetically speaking, this produces a different type of energy diagram. So before, when we looked at ethane's energy diagram, it was kind of a, just a nice even wave. When we look at butane's energy diagram, as we rotate it from 0 degrees all the way to 360 degrees with butane, and this is specifically citing down the C2, C3 bond of butane, we can have two different types of staggered conformations. So the, the best possible scenario is where the two methyl groups are anti-relative to each other. And that represents a 180 degrees dihedral angle between the methyl groups. The staggered conformations could also exist where those two methyl groups are gauche relative to each other at 300 degrees or 60 degrees. Okay? 300 would be the same as negative 60 degrees, and so I really don't care if you call it 300 or 60, but it just represents two different gauche arrangements, and they are better than eclipsed. Notice that this is the second lowest energy state, but worse than the anti-conformation in terms of energy, where energy is on my y-axis right here. 
the eclipsed conformations also come in two flavors. You can have an eclipsed conformation where the two methyl groups are sitting directly on top of each other. This doesn't get a special name like gauche or anti, it's just simply methyl methyl eclipsed. And that represents the worst possible energy state because you have both torsional strain because it's eclipsed and a tremendous amount of steric strain because those methyl groups are bumping into each other. In the other eclipsed conformation, you have still a lot of torsional strain because torsional strain occurs when you're eclipsed, but you don't have the steric strain because you're not running atoms into each other from across the molecule. So the steric strain is minimized when the two methyl groups are on opposite sides, and the steric strain is maximized when those two methyl groups are bumping directly into each other. So this represents the energy diagram for butane. And it would be a fair question to give you an energy diagram and ask you to propose a molecule that would match that particular energy diagram. And I'll show you some examples of that in the homework. So what we learned from butane is the best case scenario for a butane from kind of a side on side perspective. Let's go back to the ball and stick model. And then I'll make sure I run an energy minimization, which it just did. Notice that for butane, uh, looking down the C2, C3 bond right here, my two methyl groups, now everything is staggered, and my two methyl groups are anti-relative to each other, that that is most likely to occur if the carbon chain backbone does kind of this zigzag pattern. So if we go from butane to pentane by adding another carbon to the system right there, and then we look at it from that side-on-side -side perspective, Notice how it makes that zigzag pattern right there. And I can cite down the C2, C3 bond. And everything is perfectly staggered because all my dihedral angles are 160 degrees. And that methyl group and now the ethyl group on the bottom are anti-relative to each other. So that's the best case scenario for C2, C3. I can also cite down C3, C4. Everything is perfectly staggered and my methyl group and my ethyl group are opposite of each other. So the point of all of that is to tell you that for higher alkanes, they tend to adopt kind of this zigzag fashion. That's the generally the lowest energy state. As they get progressively longer and longer, that starts to break down. And the reason that that starts to break down is because of entropy. Like having this zigzag pattern is a very highly ordered way of minimizing the energy associated with steric strain, but as you do that over and over again, you start to run into some entropic considerations, which we don't have to care about. That's more of a general chemistry and a physical chemistry problem. So the take home lesson is the best case scenario is that your backbone of your carbon chain uh, adopts this zigzag conformation. All right, now for butane, you need to draw a Newman projection for the staggered and eclipse conformations down the C2, C3 bond. Those diagrams should look very similar to these Newman projections you drew for ethane, only you're gonna to need to put some methyl groups here and here, or here and here. Okay? I'll let you draw those. Um, and then we draw an energy diagram showing the dihedral angles from zero to 360 for butane, and I'll let you copy this diagram over here onto the lesson plan. Um, the last question we need to answer for butane is explain why the Gauche conformational isomer has a higher potential than the anti conformational isomer. Both Gauche and anti are staggered. So the difference between the two is not, so the difference is not due to torsional strain. Remember that torsional strain occurs whenever anything is eclipsed. Instead, the difference is due to the collision of the electron clouds associated with the methyl groups, clouds of the methyl groups. And that collision of the electron clouds from across the molecule is what we call steric strain. And the two types of strain. Torsional strain is when it's eclipsed, or actually torsional strain occurs whenever it's not perfectly staggered. So eclipsed is when the torsional strain is very high. And then steric strain is essentially everything else. Anytime electron density runs into something, but it's not eclipsed, then you have some type of steric strain. Okay, for pentane, draw a carbon skeleton diagram where all bonds are staggered and anti, 
And the point that I tried to make there is that occurs when you have a zigzag arrangement. So for any of the higher order alkanes, ones that are large like this, what you'll end up with is as long as you draw your carbon skeleton like this, then that assures that all of your Newman projections, if you took the time to cite down each of those bonds, would show up as being perfectly staggered and also anti. And now we want to show um, a projection down the C1, C2 bond for the staggered Gauche rotational isomer of pentane. That doesn't make sense. Let's do the C3, sorry, C2, C3. That's what this question needs to read, is C2, C3 for the staggered Gauche rotational isomer of pentane. So I'm going to go ahead and encourage you to pause the video now and try to draw this on your own. And then when you restart the video, I'll show you what it looks like. Here is the three-dimensional model of pentane. And the question, I changed the question. What I want you to do is draw a Newman projection down C2, C3. Well, we'll do C2, C2, C3 just to stay consistent with the nomenclature of ChemDraw 3D. And so that Newman projection is going to look like this. Notice how the carbon in front has a methyl group coming off of it, and the carbon in the back has an ethyl group. This is a two-carbon group. So when I draw the Newman projection for that, um, I'll start off here. The carbon in the front is going to have a methyl group on it, and then it will have two hydrogens. Let's make sure that that matches what I just saw in ChemDraw 3D. This carbon in the front has two hydrogens right there and there, and then a methyl group. Uh, let's see, the perspective that I believe I took was more like this. And you have the carbon in the front with a methyl group, and then these two hydrogens. And the carbon in the back is going to have a hydrogen up to the right, a hydrogen up to the left, and then, a, and then an ethyl group coming straight down. So that's what I want to show coming off this carbon in the back. Um, so here I kind of pre-built the back carbon. I'm just going to slide these in right there. And now what you'll notice is that the carbon in the front, which is represented by that point, has a methyl group and two hydrogens. The carbon in the back has a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here and an ethyl group right there. This is staggered. All my dihedral angles are approximately 60 degrees. And the carbon in the front has a methyl group. The carbon in the back has that ethyl group and they are 180 degrees away from each other. That means that they are anti, and that's what the question was asking me to show. Um, just for the sake of kind of completing the teaching moment, I'm going to also show you what the Gauss version of that would look like. So this right here, both of these are staggered. Okay? So staggered, uh, and this is C2, C3 confirmations. Con formations of pentane. And that's what I'll have as kind of the title of this. And then over here, this would be the gauche because those two groups are next to each other. And the other one would be anti. And of the two, the anti is the lower energy state. And it's lower in energy, not because of torsional strain. And these, have, these have minimized torsional strain because they're staggered. That's what the staggered tells me. This is the lower energy state because it reduces the steric strain, that other type of strain that occurs when atoms start bumping into each other from across the molecule. Um, so it says, draw a Newman projection along the C2-C3 bond for the staggered Gauss rotational isomer. It's this one that the question is asking for, not the anti. OK. Um, now you're ready to start answering the textbook problems and answering the chalkboard problems. There's actually five different chalkboard problems. 1A, 1B, and 1C are all separate chalkboard problems, and 2A and 2B are separate as well. This 1C right here is what's called a double-barreled Newman projection. And so to help you name this, let me show you that you have this carbon as part of a ring system, this carbon in front. It connects to this carbon right there, which is also part of that same ring system. That's two carbons. Then a carbon in the back is the third carbon of the ring system. Then this methylene carbon, which is the fourth carbon of the ring system. Then it comes and plugs into the back carbon of the right-hand side Newman projection, which is the fifth carbon in the ring system. And then this carbon in front is the sixth carbon in the ring system. So what you're looking at is kind of a, a double-barreled view of cyclohexane. And then you name the stuff coming off the cyclohexane. That's 
kind of what that question is trying to get you to think about is what does cyclohexane look like when you look at both Newman projections simultaneously? We're going to continue to work with these Newman projections specifically on cyclic molecules in days coming. So hopefully today was I was able to kind of walk you through why a Newman projection is useful when thinking about energetics and then what the Newman projection actually looks like three-dimensionally. If you purchased a model kit, um, which you may or may not have, this is the day of class when we generally pull out all the model kits and we distribute them throughout the classroom and have students kind of handle these molecules. So hopefully if you have a model kit, you can kind of use them to answer some of these questions. I always forget to fill these in for you, and I suppose I should probably stop and let you do it yourself. But for this one, because these are a lot of new concepts, let me help you out with this. Conformational isomers, rotational isomers, and rotomers are synonyms that describe the same molecule rotated to a different orientation. And it, again, it would be helpful if we just had one term for all three of those, but we don't. We have the three terms. Staggered and eclipse refer to different energetic extremes in a Newman projection. It is possible. Uh, it's not common, but it's possible to show a Newman projection where you're neither staggered nor eclipsed. You're kind of somewhere in the middle. Torsional strain is electron electron repulsion that is maximized in an eclipsed conformation conformation and then minimized in a stagger conformation and I'm done typing that you can you can write in minimize in a stagger conformation a steric strain is um, strain that occurs when parts of the molecule bump into each other. <laughs> That's pretty technical right there, I'm guessing. Into, that might be one word, might be two. I have no idea. Each other. And uh, with a model kit, usually if you can grab two atoms and kind of click them together with your model kit, that's steric strain. The dihedral angle is the angle between atoms in front and atoms in back of a Newman projection. So anytime you're asked questions about the dihedral angle, you need to be looking at a Newman projection. Gauche and anti refer to different staggered conformations. And if you remember, the Gauche uh, means that the two groups of interest are next to each other, are kind of adjacent. And the, the anti means that the two groups of interest are 180 degrees away from each other, degrees away. So you can actually have, we've kind of used Gauche and anti as absolute terms, but it's fair to say that this hydrogen right here is Gauche relative to this hydrogen right there. So that's what the Gauche refers to, and it's anti relative to this hydrogen down there the actual labels, the absolute labels, when I just called this whole thing Gauche, was based on the assumption that when somebody looks at this structure and they start asking about Gauche and anti, they're going to focus on the things that are different. So technically speaking, the methyl and the ethyl group are Gauche, and the methyl group and the ethyl group are anti.